I'm Chris Sims. And I'm Franco Terrazano. This is the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. We're dedicated to lower taxes, less waste, and more accountable government. In Deep Dive, we're going to have our federal director and recovering lawyer, Aaron Woodrick. He's going to be on to cover the Supreme Court decision on the carbon tax and talk about the next step for us taxpayers. In Waste Watch, we're going to talk about how the feds are wasting your money studying ways to take more money from your pockets through a home equity tax. It's a big deal, so stay tuned for that. But first, we actually have some really great news for you. Franco, why don't you tell the listeners about a big win in Alberta? Well, that's right, Simmer. We've got some good news for taxpayers out here, right? We just scored a big win with the Alberta government introducing recall and citizens initiative. And you know what? The Canadian Taxpayers Federation and our supporters have been the leading, the leading group pushing for recall and initiative for the last three decades. So this is a very big win for government accountability right here in Alberta. And you did hear that right. We have been fighting for recall and initiative in Alberta for three decades, 30 years. I'm pretty sure that's before Franco was born, but that's a different issue, my dear. So Franco, before we get too far in the weeds and before I tease you too much for being a millennial, why don't you give our listeners a breakdown of what recall and initiative actually means? Well, I'd love to. And I think recall might be my favorite law. And that's because it gives us voters the ability to boot misbehaving politicians more than once every four years. With recall, it allows us to collect petition signatures. And if we collect enough signatures, then we can force a recall vote or a by-election. And it really goes back to the fundamental principle that the people are supposed to be the boss. And if we are the boss, then we should always have the right to hold politicians accountable. Now, Citizens Initiative allows voters to have a direct say in the laws that govern us. So like recall with Citizens Initiative, we can collect signatures. And if we meet a certain threshold, say 10% of voters, for example, then we can pass legislation or repeal bad laws. Or at the very least, we can force a referendum to let all Albertans vote on the issue. Yeah, we've actually had recall and initiative since the 1990s here in BC. I think new kids on the block were still topping the charts. So Alberta is becoming the second province to implement these very important accountability measures. And it's good to see it happen on that side of the Rockies. We've actually had some success using recall and initiative here on the West Coast. There was a successful recall campaign to oust a former MLA who actually got caught sending fake letters to the editor to the newspapers he technically stepped down when he saw the writing on the wall so just before but he was gonna get recalled so it was working there we also used citizens initiative to repeal the hst here after the provincial government really bungled the transition from pst you know simmer you talk about recall legislation and i mean of course it's very important that it gives us the ability to force a by election But recall is much more important than just that, right? Because it also acts as a stick to help prevent politicians from misbehaving in the first place. I mean, it doesn't take a PhD in psychology to understand that politicians may think twice before dipping their hands into the taxpayer cookie jar if they may have to face us voters tomorrow rather than in four years' time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're talking about citizens' initiative. And even outside of the formal citizens' initiative process, Taxpayers have scored some big wins when we're given a chance to directly influence laws through referendums. I mean, in BC, in your neck of the woods, the CTF led the charge against the TransLink tax back in 2015, and we defeated that. Yep. Only a few years ago, we defeated the Calgary 2026 Winter Olympic bid boondoggle <laughs> through a referendum as well. Just saying that, Chris, really brings a smile to my face. I remember when you were a team Sweden and you had the Swedish flag on as a cape. That was great. And those were some good meatballs. And guess what? I'm not done yet because if Albertans had Citizens Initiative a few years ago, I am sure we would have defeated the New Democrats' provincial carbon tax and saved everyone a whole bunch of money. Yeah, that's a really serious point there. Just imagine being able to have headed that off years beforehand. This is a really big win. And you know what? The CTF and our supporters, we need to take a victory lap here on this one because we have been the organization pushing for recall and initiative for the past 30 years. 
Yeah, that's right. Well said. I mean, it's been a long and hard battle, as many of these key victories usually are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was going through the Taxpayer Magazine archives, and I found a picture from 1991 (laughs) of a young Jason Kenney presenting on behalf of the CTF to Alberta's Select Committee on Constitutional Reform about the importance of citizens' initiatives. So it's been a long fight for us. And, you know, throughout the 90s, we were pushing politicians to create referendum laws. And we even printed our own citizens initiative law for them to just copy. Here, take it, run with it, go ahead. And fast forward to last fall, well, we were there presenting to the government's Democratic Accountability Committee on the importance of both recall and initiative. But there's one more key victory that I need to mention here. You know, we took the lead on pushing for recall to be extended to local politicians in Alberta. So when Kenny first promised recall legislation when he was vying for votes ahead of that 2019 provincial election, you know, he promised recall, but he had never mentioned recall being extended to municipalities, Mm. right? But we were the first group and the leading group arguing that recall must be extended to the local level. And fortunately, the government followed our recommendations. So Alberta will have the ability to fire misbehaving MLAs and misbehaving councillors and mayors. Yeah, see, that's a really big deal. Because out here, we have it for the provincial level, but not for local city halls. So that is something that you guys are taking the lead on, and we hope to follow suit very soon here in BC. Just as a little side note, Franco actually threw Kenny's recall promise a birthday party when it turned two years old. If you haven't seen the pictures, go to our website, taxpayer.com, and check it out. He's got a cake. He's wearing a birthday hat. It's fabulous. It was our way of sending Kenny a friendly reminder that Albertans do expect recall legislation. So this is good to see. We're going to continue to fight for recall initiative across the rest of Canada. These are important accountability laws. They're really tools of direct democracy that all Canadians deserve. Speaking of important laws, though, we're going to have to throw it over now to our federal director to break down the federal carbon tax court ruling. Stay with us. It's time for Deep Dive, the part of the show that we take a closer look at the important issues for taxpayers. Now, anyone who has been following the CTF knows we spent a whole lot of time fighting carbon tax. But unfortunately, the past week wasn't exactly the greatest for those of us who oppose carbon taxes. Then, on top of that, there was a a new study by the Fraser Institute on how carbon taxes will impact the economy in future years, which is also pretty depressing. Yeah, you know, it seems like we're often being downers on this podcast. And today... I'm here with our federal director, Aaron Woodrick, who has the honor of laying out all the bad news for you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Franco. I mean, one of these days I'll have something positive to say, I'm sure. But you're right. It feels like the range of news goes from just between depressing to outrageous. And unfortunately, we have two uh, bad new things to talk about this week. Uh, First of all, by now, most people have heard that the Supreme Court of Canada finally released this decision on the federal carbon tax. uh, And by a 6-3 majority, They ruled that the federal government does have the power under the Constitution to impose a carbon tax across the country. Yeah, I'm not going to lie, man. It it really felt like a a gut punch when we got that decision. I'm here in Alberta. You know, it came out around 745 in the morning. I was ready to, to rock and roll. And then we get that decision, which, of course, was disappointing because the CTF was the only non-government official intervener that was fighting Trudeau's carbon tax. So, of course, it was disappointing. And we we really hoped that the court would have agreed that the carbon tax uh, violates provincial jurisdiction. But, you know, just to play devil's advocate, since I know some people are going to be asking us this way, if the court has made this ruling, well, why doesn't the CTF just give up the fight and fight something else? Like, isn't this issue now settled? Well, you and I know it's definitely not settled. And let's be crystal clear, the CTF has definitely not given up the fight. Uh, I think we need to remember what the court actually said here. They didn't say carbon taxes were mandatory, and they didn't say that that Trudeau has to impose one. What the court said was that Ottawa, as the federal government, is allowed to impose one. Now, I can tell you, I'm a lawyer, I have some experience with constitutional law. 
there's a lot of things the federal government can do that are still bad ideas. And the carbon tax is just another one of those bad ideas. Uh, CTF, we've always said that we'd use every tool at our disposal to fight the federal carbon tax. And joining in these constitutional challenges that the province has launched was just one of those tools. So, of course, we accept that the Supreme Court says it's legal, but that doesn't change the fact we oppose it because it's still bad policy, uh, which is, in a nutshell, a whole lot of economic pain for basically no environmental gain. Yeah, well, there you have it, folks. We're going to keep ground and pounding this carbon tax and really going to ramp up our efforts in the court of public opinion. And just because Trudeau can hammer families and businesses with a crippling carbon tax, it doesn't mean he has to, and it doesn't mean he should. And speaking of hammering families and businesses with a crippling tax, just before the Supreme Court decision came down, the Fraser Institute put out a new study looking at what will happen to our economy if the federal carbon tax increases to $170 per ton by 2030, as the Trudeau government said it intends to do. So let me guess, rainbows and lollipops. Yeah, uh, or more like a, a, a punch to the gut. I mean, you've heard that old saying about no pain, no gain. Well, if you read this report, it suggests that the carbon tax is more like all pain, no gain. Yeah, su surprise, surprise. Uh, so anyways, give us the nuts and bolts here. What is the, is the report looking at? Uh, is it just the economic side or is it also the environmental side as well? Uh, it actually looks at both, but that's actually what makes it even more bleak. But if you start with the economic side of the study, um, it suggests that by 2030, the economy will be $37 billion smaller than it otherwise would be. And hope you're sitting down for this number. The job losses by 2030 will total 184,000. 184,000 jobs lost? You heard me right. And it gets even worse than that because... Because of the shrinking economy, the tax base shrinks because fewer people have jobs and there's fewer businesses and they have lower profits. That means government revenue drops. So deficits start to get bigger too. The whole thing is just like a vicious circle of economic pain. It really should not be a surprise to anyone. Um, when you raise costs, you kill jobs, you reduce economic activity. The fact you call it a carbon tax instead of a different tax doesn't change the fact it's still a cost. Just like it was revenue neutral, just like it, it was in British Columbia until it wasn't anymore. And why? Because we had a new government come in in BC. They decided that they wanted to keep that money. Uh, and now if you go back to the federal government and consider that this massive debt hangover, hundreds of billions in new debt that the federal government has run up because of the pandemic, now imagine them looking desperately at this huge pot of billions of dollars in carbon tax revenue that they're, they're giving back right now. How much do you want to bet they're starting to look pretty closely at, at keeping their hands on that money? Yeah, very good points there. And let's not forget, 184,000 jobs loss could be the outcome of that increasing Trudeau carbon tax. So I don't think people are really going to be made whole once they lose their job and they get a measly rebate. Like, do these proponents of the carbon tax think that those 184,000 workers who lose their livelihoods should be sending Trudeau a thank you letter for those rebates? Man, it really just frustrates me. Anyways, Aaron, do you have any other salt that you want to be rubbing in our wounds today? How about, can I interest you in higher energy prices as well? Because uh. that's what we're going to get as well, of course, with this. You combine this with the second carbon tax, because don't forget, there's more than one. There's another one called the Clean Fuel Standard. You're looking at massively more expensive energy, including and especially gasoline. Yeah, but this is, this is worth all the sacrifice, right? Because we're going to be saving the planet. Sure, if by saving the planet you mean that we're going to reduce global emissions by 0.3% by 2030, then I guess, yeah, we're saving the planet. Uh, so you're telling me that even after jacking up the carbon tax to $170 per ton, imposing a second carbon tax costing hundreds of thousands of jobs and destroying tens of billions in economic activity that's all we're getting for this well you got to remember that at the end of the day canada is only 1.5 percent of global emissions so there's only so much we can do and even under this plan which some people are calling an aggressive plan emissions actually only drop at best by 26 percent which is not even enough to meet our paris targets which some people also say is, is not aggressive enough so you can imagine just how much more cost and pain uh canadians would have to incur to get that number down even more this is just mind-boggling so even if the government is successful in bringing our economy to a screeching halt it's really not going to be doing much for the global environment. And I think that really just shows why whatever the theory, 
carbon taxes don't deliver in reality, and they do a ton of damage to Canadian families and our business community in the process. And that's exactly why the CTF has been, and we're going to continue to fight carbon taxes right here in Canada. Now, if you want to do a little bit more reading on the economics, well, we're going to link to the Fraser Institute's report in our show notes. It's time for Waste Watch. This is where we make fun of the dumb things that governments are wasting your money on. Our investigative journalist, James Wood, he's back. He's back with us again this week, and he has got a story that should have everybody paying attention from across Canada, especially if you own a house. James, what have you got? So I'll start off. I want to read you a quote. Okay. First, here's a tweet from the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation that went out this summer. Quote, the suggestion that the CMHC is funding a study on any tax measure is inaccurate and misleading reporting. We are co-funding a solution lab on housing wealth and inequality. We do not control the agenda nor the research base, which is a minor component of the protocol. End quote. Okay, so if you're a homeowner or you're hoping to eventually afford one, that sounds like good news. It sounds like CMHC is saying that they are not thinking about taxing people when they sell their homes. But I do remember that there was a lot of coverage of this back in the summertime from the online news site, Black Locks Reporter. They're an investigative journalism website based out of Ottawa. They were reporting that CMHC was looking at a home equity tax. So what's the deal here? Um, let, me, let me read you another quote. We aim to engage multiple generations in the search for housing policy adaptations that work for all while reducing affordability challenges facing young adults. Policy adaptations that will receive attention include opportunities to shift from some current or future taxation of earnings towards more taxation of housing wealth. <laughs> okay, if I'm looking at those two quotes... That one's saying the opposite thing. <laughs> Oppor opportunities to shift from some current or future taxation of earnings toward more taxation of housing wealth. Clearly, they're looking at a home equity tax. What the heck else could that possibly mean to shift taxation to housing wealth? But better question, uh, where is this all coming from? Well, I mean, it turns out Black Fox was on the right track. That second quote was from records I recently obtained from CMHC, which clearly show the agency funded a study that set out to look at changes to tax policy when it comes to homes in Canada. I'll read you a third quote, which is direct from that project's charter. Quote, One key source of this intergenerational inequality is tax policy that privileges home ownership and shelters housing wealth, especially in principal residences, from taxation by comparison with other assets. End quote. Now, that charter, which was signed in March 2020, goes on to say the study would examine tax and other public finance opportunities to level the intergenerational playing field. Okay, I took a look at this charter earlier, and that charter that you just quoted from was signed by both the CMHC, that's basically a wing of the government, and Generation Squeeze. That's the group of people at UBC doing this study. Listeners should remember the CMHC and the federal government, led by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's liberals, they were falling all over themselves last summer, denying this black lock story. The fact remains, CMHC was paying $250,000 for this study, and Generation Squeeze has been critical of the fact that Canadians don't pay capital gains taxes on the sale of their principal homes for years it is not rocket science to connect those big flashing dots. Yeah, definitely. And, and falling over themselves is a good way to describe it. Like, Siddle, who was on his way out of the CMHC, was particularly vocal in his denials. At one point, he actually tweeted at Black Locks, and I'll read out what he said. Quote, don't let facts get in the way of your poorly researched story. Instead, continue to promote your fabricated story so the people who serve the public have to distract themselves from doing things to improve our country. End quote. Ooh, I don't know about you, but as a longtime journalist, fabricated story? Them's fighting words. Mm. Okay, so they're trying to say that Black Locks is bad at doing journalism. Well, they, they are the public servants who are diligently trying to improve our country. Nothing to see here? 
Yeah, <laughs> with language like that in the mix, I figured a closer look was, was needed. On top of the charter, I also obtained emails between the study's leader, UBC professor Paul Kershaw, and Mr. Siddle, which took place before CMHC even funded the work. The second quote I had earlier about the tax shift, that's direct from those emails, and it shows Siddle would have been aware of the study's focus on home taxation changes from the get-go. And see, this is what I don't get. This pretending is starting to get really weird. Like, they know that we can see and hear them, right? Like, Generation Squeeze and plenty of academics over at UBC, they've made no bones about it for years. They've been pushing for or praising the idea of a capital gains tax on the sale of your home, the one you're living in right now, your primary residence, for years. This is their thing. Like, I just debated one of them on the radio last week for half an hour, like, out loud. Like, CMHC should just own this or maybe they're too scared of being taxed for that ownership. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good point. Maybe they are. I mean, with everything I had seen and with all those records, what I was seeing in those records, I, I reached out to CMHC to ask about what I was seeing. What's your guess on how they responded? Okay, so I'm a little older than you, but I'm picturing that moment in the first Austin Powers movie uh, where the authorities are going through that box of his belongings and it's in front of this girl he's trying to impress and they pull out a tool for a certain body part and he's all embarrassed and he says, that's not my bag, baby. That's not me. Turns out there was a receipt and a warranty and a book about it that he wrote. That's what I'm picturing. Not my bag. <laughs> I mean, it, it's pretty much on the money. They they <laughs> they stuck with the original explanation. I and I quote from their from their message back to me: "Nothing has changed, and as the documents suggest, we are not funding a study on a home equity tax." Another key thing they said: a home equity tax is not the focus of the study. Okay, so it's not a focus, but saying it isn't a focus isn't saying it can't be looked at. With you and me getting a bill to the tune of a quarter of a million dollars. And they did confirm the study kept rolling after the initial outcry back in the summer. And the final report is due in June. So with all that, we'll see what steps the feds take then once they have that report in their hands. Okay. It is springtime. And if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and it says that it's going to study home taxation, then it might just be a study about home taxation. Don't know about you, but I think it's kind of obvious. But listeners... Don't take our words for it. Head on over to our website, taxpayer.com. James has posted all of these documents for you to look at yourselves, and you can read them. You decide if we are paying to have CMHC and UBC study capital gains taxes on the sale of your house. And if that's not your bag, baby, then be sure to stay on our website and sign our petition against the home equity tax. Because if we don't push back against this nonsense right now, you better believe we're going to be paying for it in the future. James, thank you for bringing us this. That's it. That's the show. And uh, before we go, Franco, I think we have to do the mailbag. Uh, did you get any love this past week? I did. You know, I'm, I usually read off all the, the, the hate that I get on Twitter, but I got a, got a nice little message today or this week, and it was, quote, hey, great job. Keep up the good work, honey. Love ya. So I got to give a big shout out to Mama Terrazano there. Thank you there, Mom. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Luckily, my family uh, don't make eye contact with me on social media, so I don't get any comments from any family, unfortunately. But here's a person who apparently isn't a family member uh, from Randy. Uh, he's really concerned about the carbon tax here in British Columbia, and he runs a very small farm, so not sure about his exemptions or whatnot there on the farm. But he says that the carbon tax, once it's up, is going to cost $300 to fuel a lot of his machinery and he wonders aloud i wonder how many we would be able to get to charge on a 45 ton electric picker weighing at 62,000 kilograms and i think he's being a bit facetious there because i think he's pointing out that they actually don't have that technology yet but let's keep our fingers crossed so all this to say the carbon tax is going to cost people a lot of money just to exist so thank you all for all of your great comments online uh, do keep them coming uh, feel free to send us an email anytime yeah, and don't forget to please like share and subscribe to the podcast and please just share with your friends and family help us get the word out to more taxpayers and before we let you go we have to give a huge thank you very much to our investigative journalists and our podcast editor james wood 
Thank you, Jimbo, for making it sound like we actually know what we're talking about. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, President of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. If you've got another minute, I'd like to ask you to think about the one person you know that would really enjoy listening to this podcast. Do us a favor and do them a favor and send them a quick note to let them know about it. At the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we believe there is power in numbers. That's why we've worked so hard to build an army of taxpayers who are ready to push back. And we did it because people like you shared our work with that one person that they knew would really appreciate taking part. Thanks for listening, and thanks for doing your part to make Canada a better place.